So thank you all for, for making it up the 405, well done, or down the 101. Uh, and I'm uh, honored to be here. Um, I'm especially honored because I've recently been invited to join the advisory panel here. And I would have given your advice for free, but uh, he tells me there's a huge salary and then I get my own building. <laughs> Um, so I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be here and I'm really just glad to be able to participate in what I think is far and away uh, one of the best schools in the country, full stop. You know, not about any specific issue, but I think that's one of the general principles that I want to talk with you about, which is that inside dyslexia, there are lessons for all of us on resiliency, on shame, on possibility, and on changing the world. And the essential thing that I want everyone to get out of this talk today is that your children are not broken, dyslexia is not a disease, and that if you form community as you are doing here at Westmark, your kid is going to do great. So let me um, jump in and just start laying out some of the principles, and I'm going to speak for you know maybe half an hour, maybe less, given the time, because I want to allow time for questions. I think there's always much more interesting things coming out of your heads than out of mine. Let's try our tech and see what we can do here. So, did that work? Uh, let's just go, you know. Um, so, I'm here representing uh, Headstrong Nation. Could I ask someone to work with me over here to drive those? Because the camera's in the center and I don't want to walk in and out of that constantly. Thank you, Mary. You can even move the laptop and sit if you want. Um, but, okay, great, thank you. So, Headstrong Nation is the national organization for adults who are dyslexic. I was the founder of it in 2003. We've been around for 10 years, based in San Francisco. And we have a website that has a lot of really useful information uh, that is free and available. And I would encourage you to check it out. I'll come back to some of that content as we go forward. But it is really the beginning of a movement. And that's something that I want to enter entertain you here today, is that you have an opportunity to join a much larger group of people who are trying to change this issue. It is 2.3 million kids in the US public school system who are formally identified as having a specific learning disability. A large number of them are dyslexic. A moment on language. When I say dyslexia, I mean dyscalculia, dysgraphia, ADHD. I think of us all as coming from the same country, essentially. And uh, one of us is in dyslexia, and then our neighbors to the north is ADHD, and our Mexico is dyscalculia, and we have these borders that we share that are relatively open. We have the you know, the, the dyslexia free trade agreement between us all that allows us to go back and forth. We also may be resident in more than one country. I use the term dyslexia just because you can't say all those, all those words all at once. And it also is true for kids who might be, say, on the, uh, slightly on the spectrum or kids who have uh, EDD issues. Issues that basically put someone outside the mainstream are still related to the issues of resiliency and shame that I want to talk with you about today. So let's go forward one slide. Oh yeah, go Great. Um, one of the things I'd like to do is, is lay out my, um, my credentials, and one of the things i found is that people look at me and they think, well, you don't look dyslexic. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you look like an idiot. <laughs> but here we are. And I try and establish that this is still part of who I am. And so I was identified when I was eight years old. Uh, as a kid, my mother read out loud to me, which wasn't a big deal. When I went to college, I would fax my term papers home to her in New Hampshire, and she would read them to me over the phone. Not good for me, not good for my mom, right? Uh, it was incredibly nice of her to do so, but over time, I started using technology and finding that I could use other services to, to you know, replace her, so I didn't have to call her every time I needed to read a menu or something like that. Now, this is an image that was taken at Stanford uh, Medical School when I was a graduate student there. And it is an fMRI, a functional magnetic resonance image of the human brain while reading. Quick show of hands, has anyone seen images like this before? And the camera is, okay, great, a large number, that's great. So um, this one is, is an interesting one because on the left side are um, non-dyslexics, and you can see that uh, the uh, temporal parietal lobe mainly, which is put your finger right above your ear, that's where the language center of the brain in terms of reading is. Um, that region is lighting up like a Christmas tree for them, right? Like it's really active. I am literally the guy on the left. That's my brain trying to read, right? Or at least I read, use my eyes. So I always use these terms carefully. There are multiple forms of reading. There is eye reading, there's ear reading, and there's finger reading. So blind people read braille. They read with their fingers. 
There's eye reading, mainstream people use their eyes to read. I hear read, so I listen to material. We'll have a demonstration of that later. Now, it's critical for you to understand that all three are reading. She agrees. Uh, that all three are reading. Um, and I use the term reading because that has such power in our culture. Someone is bookish, they are well read. They are someone who is a person of letters. And if you're going to be someone who competes in that world, you need to do that. Now, I went to Stanford Law School and I never read a book, right? Uh, with my eyes, but I read a ton of them with my ears. And I did that using audio and other forms of uh, information like that. So, this is how my brain works today. I mean, it was 10 years ago, but I was still an adult. One, one for it. So this was a series of blogs that I wrote for the National Center on Learning Disabilities. Um, uh, and the, you know, the headline um, was really that uh, dyslexia should be about strengths, not about shame. And that's the main thing I want to bring home today. Now, okay, that's the text. It's up there. It's fine. For those in the room who are uh, good eye readers, you'd be reading it. For those who are like me, you're like, great, it's a lot of text. I'm going to tune out for a little while right now. <laughs> um, let's go forward one minute. This is what it actually looks like when I write that today. So if you look at it, what do you notice? You notice the red squiggly lines under like a good third of the words, right? And you've got words out of place, paragraphs are a little wacky. So what happened here is I actually fully converted out of using text as a way of communicating in a standard way. I don't use a keyboard really, I use it for keystrokes, but I speak and my computer using Dragon writes it for me and spits it out. So what I did here was I had my computer read it back to me, and then I just retyped it and tried to keep up with what I was hearing and just listen to it. I got to play it over so I could, you know, like trying to speed type. But this is the best I can do without the assistance of a number of different pieces of technology. If I was in a wheelchair, this is me dragging myself up a set of stairs, is what this is, right? As opposed to before it was with a ramp. And I like to show this particularly to your children. So in my book, in, in the Dyslexia Empowerment Plan, at the end of the first chapter, I got Random House to publish the raw version. That was fun getting the editors to be like, no, 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 the spelling mistakes are part of the book. That's actually, yes, I know the words out of order. Yes, I know. Um, they, they actually were incredibly helpful. They've been super supportive. It's one of the reasons that I, I, I went with them, because they, they think there's a movement happening here. Um, I just got to tell us, I just got a, a second message today. They just went to their third reprint on the, on the book, which is like amazing. You know, and that's really, um, that or they just had me and thought I wasn't very good on Rivol. And they print like one book and then I wrote two books. So, uh, eight books, wow, good job. Um, so, uh, so let's go forward uh, and actually mention the book here. Uh, one more here, thank you. So this is the book, The Dyslexia Empowerment Plan. I like to highlight that you know I'm here as a representative of, of Headstrong, but I also function as an individual. Uh, and, and I use the moniker BenFloss.com, which is a different, you know, that is a separate thing from my nonprofit, and I have a Twitter feed that I actually use. It's not a staff, and I tweet there. And if you're into that, go check it out. Um, it's a good way to actually ask me a question that you're burning to ask that I will answer it, and keep in mind, you're answering it in front of, you know, everyone in the world, but um, that's there. The other thing I threw up here was a review, and this, um, this was an interesting thing. The review was a good review. It was a star review in, in Publishers Weekly, great. But the thing was, I had gone on a journey learning about the book industry that I did not know anything about, right? Turns out there's something called new book smell. I, I didn't know this. Like, you crack a book open and people start sniffing my book. And I was like, what are you doing? Like, it's new book smell. It's great. And I was like, okay, that's weird. I'm like, seems like you're kind of a fetishist, but fine. Uh, and I didn't understand, so when Publishers Weekly said something, I was like, who are they and what does this mean? And so my editor was like, oh, well, this is this and that. And I realized how out of the world of books I had been my whole life. And I had to come around and become part of them through this process, which was a very interesting moment. So I showed you all of that, uh, that sort of problematic stuff before because people see a book and they see Stanford and all this stuff and they think, well, that's not my kid. Or, um, uh, or they think, well, I, he must have been cured, right? And that's how he did it. No, 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 I don't I read him completely. I never do it. And I started consuming much more information and being much more productive. And that's a conversion that I went through that was incredibly important. <coughs> um, this is uh, a, a, a little quiz. Um, this is where I want to talk to you um, for a moment about the nature of the evaluations that we use to assess people's intelligence. We pretend that we can actually perceive this thing with a four-hour exam. 
I can tell how smart you are. Really. Um, funny thing, because when you rise in a career in the military, there isn't like one four-hour test we can use to figure out whether you're a good general. We actually do lots of different things to find out how good you are. Also, it turns out if you're going to be a Formula One race car driver, or the CEO of a company, or anyone who's done anything that's important in the entire world, we don't rely on four hours to hire someone. We actually look at a body of work to figure out who they are. But somehow, when we go to college, we have a four-hour exam that's going to answer this question, which, by the way, has no predictive power at all if you actually look at the numbers. This is from the Weschler test of adult intelligence, which was one of the baseline exams that we use in the world of dyslexia to establish whether someone is dyslexic to get a baseline of their intelligence. Well, let's look at this test from one. The question that goes with this test is, which three of these blocks combine to make the image above? Okay, so they were going for, I think, six, one, and two. Okay, didn't they contemplate that they didn't actually tell me whether we could stack images? Hmm. So it could be five, six, and one on top of five. It could be two and uh, five and six. It could, it could be like 17 different combinations if you think outside the box. That's why I picked the box. Uh, and you get penalized for actually doing anything outside what they were predicting. Now, where's the flaw? Is the flaw in the creative thinker or in the test? The flaw is in the test. The flaw is not in the person in the wheelchair, it is in the stairs. The stairs were badly designed. If they were a ramp, then everyone could use them. This is a poorly designed test. Yet, when we get a number, we want to know what that number means, and we just cling to it. So I propose that we start using a different set of numbers that are research-based to evaluate actually matters. Let's go forward one more. Um, as we make a transition, the old way of doing things was to consider this a disease. It is the medical model. And there were words like, you're diagnosed with dyslexia. Well, I'm from New Hampshire, okay? I'm not diagnosed as from New Hampshire. I'm just from New Hampshire, right? It's just a thing, right? Now, if you're from New Jersey, <laughs> just saying. Uh, but uh, we, we remediate this person's dyslexia. But that's cancer, right? No, no, we train the kid how to do different types of reading. Very important to train the kid to do uh, eye reading as much as you can. You want to do like two years of a multi-sensory um, organ gilling and methodology, and there's many different flavors, all excellent. If you, you know, spend the time on that, do like two years of it, but then drop it. And this is controversial to some people until you've actually spent a lot of time with dyslexics, but uh, there was a parent who was saying, well, but we have our child do 20 minutes a night of, of reading. And I was like, with their eyes, yes. And I was like, how old is your child? Well, this child was you know, in middle school, and you've done a couple of yes, and is your child getting better at reading? Well, we, you know, we think, we hope. I'm like, that's a bad idea. You shouldn't do that. Because it's essentially slow drip trauma you're introducing into that child's life. The home environment should be a safe space where they're looking forward to being. So let's give them something that's useful and interesting to them start them off with some Harry Potter audiobook, and then move on to this week's history homework as an audiobook, if audio is their strength. Now, if, they're a different, if they have a different set of strengths, right, if they're kinesthetic, if they're like movement-oriented, let's not study science from a lab, a uh, lab book, rather, let's go in the lab, and let's play with beakers and you know, build stuff and think in an actual three-dimensional world as opposed to off of a piece of paper. Why we picked books as the way to teach every single subject makes no sense. Uh, they are a great way to store information circa 1700. <laughs> okay? Like, there's been a little bit of evolution in the technology ever since. Anyone got the iPhone 5S, right? Well, it turns out the iPhone 3 would have blown, like, Galileo's mind. Like, it just would have been like, oh my god. Like, I mean, so we have so much better options to go with, and we should take advantage of them. Um, let's uh, look at the other words, um, overcome, uh, reader, struggle with. One, struggle with a bad school, not with dyslexia, right? Um, one did not overcome dyslexia. I didn't overcome being from New Hampshire. Oh, he was from New Hampshire. <laughs> he overcame it, though. No, I integrated that I was from New Hampshire. If Freer dies on the license plate, I'm okay with that. You know, like, it's fine. Uh, 
reader becomes eye reader, ear reader, finger reader. So there is reading and there is eye reading, but there's also ear reading, and they both have places. And frankly, students who are great eye readers should probably practice a little ear reading, because being able to follow a narrative through audio is a useful skill. Um, and I mean, eventually, maybe they have to learn finger reading. I don't think we need to sign everyone up for that, but it, it is a useful skill. And I always point this out, because people will be like, but if he's listening to it, he's not reading. I'm like, well, do people who read Braille read? Well, yeah, I guess so, because you can't do it, so it must be reading, right? Um, well, what about blind people who can't read Braille? Will they listen to books? Oh, are they reading? Yes. Okay, then it's all reading, and we're good here, right? So that's the path that I would rec recommend. Let's go forward one more. Um, so let's talk about uh, strengths and, um, and that kind of thing. Before I jump into this, I want to give you just a framework to think about, um, which is I want to do a little, a little exercise here. Um, now, my first car was a beat-up Honda Civic. That was my first car that I, that I got. Um, I want everyone here to think of their first car that they had. It's Los Angeles, so I'm going to assume they were in New York, they'd be like, I remember that. But <laughs> here, you won't be coming. Um, so would anyone care to share what their fabulous first car was? Anyone? Yes. Okay, what else? VW Bug. VW Bug, what else? Okay, now, what unites all of these cars? Wheels. What else? They get you to your destination, they're transportation. They're all combustion engines. They all burn oil. Well, that's what we've done for 100 years. We've burned oil to get places. Now, there are electric cars that use something other than oil. And many people look at them and they think, I don't have an electric car, that might not be as good. I want to propose that reading with your eyes is oil. And reading in other ways is electric. Now, let me show you what an electric car could look like. Here is uh, a quick video demonstration. Um, there's an old saying in Intel, which is, do a demo, lose a sale. Um, <laughs> So let's see how this goes. So this is, I think, what many people think of when they think of, a, of an electric car. We're waiting on the Nissan Leaf, we're waiting on the Chevy Volt. I have the currently existing club car, street legal golf cart. And what I'm going to be doing with this is taking it out to the nearest public charging station to the Los Angeles Times, which happens to be at the Santa Monica Pier. So you get a feeling, that's what electric cars meant. So when you say to someone, my kid uses audiobooks, this is what they think is happening, right? <laughs> but there's this car company called Tesla. Anybody heard of it? Yeah. Yeah. Tesla, think I love that Tesla. They just crossed $20 billion in market capitalization. GM is about double that, which is crazy, because Tesla makes like one car, maybe two. But they're that exciting to be in. If you've been in one, they're mind-blowing. Because they go 0 to 60 in 4.6 seconds. And I don't know if I did this. But 60 to 120 in an additional 4 seconds. Yeah, it's just a linear acceleration curve. So let's look at what an ear reading could be. I'm Ezra Dyer for Automobile Magazine. We're here at Gingerman Raceway with the Tesla Model S and the BMW M5. Now a lot of the discussion about the Tesla is centered on its range, its price, and whether Tesla has a business case or not. We're here to answer one very simple question. Can it outdrag an M5? Tesla Model S, the thing that people are most probably concerned about is the th it, it blew it away, right? Now, the reason it can do that is because it just has a linear acceleration curve. And then here's the best part. Do you know what the maintenance plan is on this car? Buy the car, bring it back in a million miles. See you later. 
There's no hydraulics. There's no air filtration system. There's no, you don't have to cool it because it's just one piston. Like, it's not even a piston, it's just a ball bearing, two ball bearings and a, and a, and a rotor, right? Like, it's incredible, right? That's a very different way of approaching things. So let me give you now the correlation in the reading context. This is a video from, uh, from Headstrong, uh, the website. So we have videos that demonstrate how to do all this stuff. And uh, you'll see me working with a young man. So let's just watch uh, uh, the old form of reading and the new form of reading. Hi, my name's Ben Foss, and today we're gonna be demonstrating for you super fast speech technology and explaining why it's useful. Uh, I've been joined today by Mayu, who has graciously volunteered to uh, take the lesson on how this works. Mayu, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in this technology. Um, I think it could probably be a really cool tool to use uh -huh. for learning, and it could probably really help in school. Okay, would you describe yourself as dyslexic? Yeah, I would. Do you have an easier time listening to content than you do reading content? Uh, it goes both ways sometimes, it kind of back and forth, Okay. so, uh, but yeah, listening to it is definitely easier though. Okay, so um, what are your kind of favorite things to, to uh, follow for news or, or that kind of thing? Uh, I'm a big sports fan, okay. I like the Oakland A's. Oakland A's? Alright, go A's. Uh, so let me open up a, a browser here, I'm going to use a standard iPad, we're running operating um, system uh, 6, uh, it's actually 6.1. And so I've already um, got uh, a web browser open, and let's find some content here on the Oakland days. So what do you want to look at? You want to look at the news for the Oakland days and kind of what's going on in the uh, preview of uh, this upcoming game? Yeah, sure. Okay, so let's go into this one here. So we're going to select that content. And um, once we have this article open, I'll be able to select the content and then have it read aloud. So here's the content. I'm going to make it a little bigger. I'm going to actually select this article. Uh, and I'm going to uh, be able to highlight it by dragging that down. Now it's going to read it aloud. You ready? Yeah. Anaheim. As the A's begin the second half of the 2013 season, they have tough steps to follow. In each of the previous four seasons, the A's have posted a better record after the All-Star break than before it. Since so now I'm going to pause it. So we've been reading about the A's. Now, um, a little thing you may not know. Standard readers, when they're reading, will read at about twice that rate. So they'll read um, much faster. So if you were given an hour's worth of homework and they were given an hour's worth of homework, if you listen to it th at this speed, you've got two hours worth of homework versus one hour worth of homework. I'm guessing you would like one hour's worth of homework. homework. <laughs> yeah. So let's see if we might try this a little bit faster, okay? okay. Um, first, I'm actually gonna show you how fast I listen to it now, because I've been using this for a long time. I used this to go to school for a long time, and I, I kind of got familiar with it. So first, I'm gonna change the speed real quick. Um, and uh, you can do that by going into the speech menu, and then I'm gonna go to the fastest setting. You ready? It's gonna yeah. be pretty fast. Speech selection read selected content. All right. Now I'm gonna go back to our article and I'm gonna highlight uh, the paragraph below and I'm gonna start reading about it. So I've highlighted that paragraph and now- So the question facing the A's as they open the second half of the pre-game series against the Los Angeles Angels beginning Friday in Anaheim because <laughs> how much better could they get? They led the American League West by two games and they're in total. 56 is the second best in the AL, trailing only the Boston Red Sox. How's that working for you? Uh, it's a little bit difficult. A little bit difficult. Sometimes, um, on like like I have certain applications uh -huh. that I have. Uh, it, it depends. Like some certain books, I might listen to it not maybe that fast, but a little bit slower than that. Okay, so let's try something. Which is, I'm going to take it now before we were at this rate. Speak selection reads selected content. And I'm going to go up a third of the way, so the midpoint now towards mine. Speak selection reads selected content. How does that sound to you? That's fine. That working for you? Yeah, maybe uh, like a little faster, a little slower. A little faster. A little faster. faster. Okay. Speak selection reads selected content. All right. Yeah. Let's Let's try that. So you just went halfway up the scale from where you were to where you are. So let's take this um, this section here and let's read it. And um, I want you to kind of see if this is comfortable for you to follow. So the question facing the A's as they open the second half with the three-game series against the Los Angeles Angels beginning Friday in Anaheim is this. How much better can they get? They led the American League West by two games. And their win total, 56, is the second best in the AL, trailing only the Boston Red Sox. There we go. Yeah. Is that comfortable for you? That's comfortable. So uh, now, now here comes the proof. You ready for this? You didn't know there was going to be a quiz, but um, how many games? Uh, how many games have they won total so far? Fifty-six. Fifty-six. There we go. <laughs> so that's a demonstration of using speech technology. If you increased that uh, ten percent every week for the next five weeks, I bet you could get yourself up to the top speed, and then you'd only have one hour homework. How would you like that? <laughs> That'd be cool. Okay. So that's a demonstration of very fast speech. There you go. So I, that to me is 
the old, that's actually the old electric versus the new electric. You think of the putt-putt and you get the Tesla if you train into it. That 20 minutes a night, if you put the 20 minutes a night into that, you're preparing your kid to go take on some pretty remarkable challenges and to just read at the standard rate that they read. Now, standard readers see that and like, oh my god, that was incredibly hard. I don't understand. I'm like, how do you know what it looks like when I watch you read? <laughs> like, I'm like, you went through that so fast and I totally missed it. And like, it's just the inverse of the coin that you have, that you're seeing here. Um, and just out of curiosity, I saw a number of people closing their eyes. Did anyone feel comfortable with the, the medium rate one that, that, that Maya was okay with by a show of hands? Anyone? Hands up? Okay. Did anyone feel comfortable with the fast one? Okay. So it, 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 it's doable. It, incidentally, I put you at a slight disadvantage. This is just from my days at the Intel Reader. Um, it, on speakers in a room like this, the sound's bouncing a lot, and so you're not getting as clear and dedicated a signal. So if you were in earbuds, it would go, go better. It looks really different to you, but I can tell you, many of your children will be much better at this than they are at reading. It's not a standard skill for all dyslexics, but. Now, I want to wrap up by talking about strengths and attitudes, and then we'll go to questions. Um, uh, let's go back to the presentation. Uh, we didn't blow the demo. All right. So, um, so one of the things that I'd like to point out is that uh, everyone has strengths and weaknesses, and. We seem to want to focus on everyone's weaknesses in the school system. We want to make you do the thing you can't do, which is like the inverse of what a good office does, right? Everyone's like, hey, you're the worst public speaker in our group. You're presenting to the board of directors. <laughs> and you are terrible with machines. Can you go down and fix the heating system? Great. Like, this would be the inverse of how we run anything else. But here we're like, you're a bad speller. Time to study spelling over and over and over and over again. Right? It's not, it's not the way we approach the world in other spaces, but somehow in school, it's like that, right? So what happens is, I like to think of people in terms of these strengths. Verbal, social, narrative, spatial, kinesthetic, visual, mathematics, scientific, and musical. You can think of famous people in each of these categories who are dyslexic. Verbal, you get someone like uh, 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 Keira Knightley, or um, the governor of the state of Connecticut, Dan Malloy. Uh, social, you get someone like Ari Emanuel. Very social guy. In this room, you know that he's like the super agent, right? He's a very social guy. Not always nice to everyone, maybe, but very social. Uh, uh, you also might get someone like Aaron Brockovich. You know, here's a person who's out there, you know, working with people, trying to figure things out. Narrative, people like John Irving, people like uh, uh, Steven Spielberg has recently announced he's dyslexic. He can tell you a story better than almost anyone in the world. It's a really strong skill for him. Spatial, uh, people who can work in three dimensional space. So you get uh, people like um, uh, architects, uh, the person who designed the Pompidou Center in Paris, dyslexic guy named uh, Richards is his name. Um, amazing, amazing architect. Um, kinesthetic, people like Magic Johnson, or for the young kids, Tebow. Um, uh, uh, visual, pa painters like Robert Rauschenberg. Uh, mathematics scientific, winner of the Nobel Prize in 2009 for medicine, dyslexic, incredible woman. Uh, and then musical, uh, Cher. <laughs> Uh, lead singer of Oasis, uh, Maroon 5, dot, dot, dot. So those are strengths that you play to. You, do, you can do this assessment on the Headstrong website or in the book, and you find out your top three. Here's mine. So I'm pretty verbal, I'm pretty social, and I'm not bad at telling a story. Music, visual, not so much. Not my strengths. Let's not put me in charge of the musical visual presentation of the board, right? Just have me talk. It'll work out fine. Uh, I also had Mr. Meredith do so Mr. Meredith actually scored this, and you can see that he scored almost near the point, this is the one off the website, in kinesthetic. And I, I was, this was news to me. Near, where does your kinesthetic skill come out? What are your hobbies that, that show this? Woodworking, so you build you, and you make like beautiful stuff? Okay, I didn't know that. That's his skill, right? And you'll notice that this campus embraces people who are kinesthetic, because he thinks through how those students would approach the world. Um, in addition, uh, quite, uh, quite verbal, and a strong narrative. I mean, he can tell a story, right? Fundraising, telling a story, just telling you. Um, <laughs> so, I don't mean to bring you there. Um, uh, so, uh, then I want to come back to attitudes. Um, the main thing here is to think about uh, resiliency is the most important of these values. That is, that is the act of bouncing back. And this is based on research that was done by Marshall Raskin, who is the chief clinical psychologist for Charles Schwab's uh, uh, group. He's not a psychologist, he's a clinical researcher for Charles Schwab's research group. Charles Schwab, dyslexic. Um, 
And resiliency in particular, when you think about a child who's dyslexic, to build resiliency, you do two things. And this is general for all children. You give them unconditional love. You love them no matter what happens. And you give them responsibility, commensurate with their skill level. If they're old enough to clean the garage, Sunday they're cleaning the garage. If they can do the dishes, they do the dishes. If they're responsible for mapping and planning the entire family vacation, then you give them that job. And they then take on a sense of pride about who they are and a sense of worth. And those two things, in combination, do a very good job to improve that. There are other metrics here, which I'll come back to in question time, but over time, these, these highlight, and if you expand them, you will strengthen your child's long-term outcomes. So much so that a study that they did Marshall Rasmussen led it. 20 year study of graduates from the Cross Six schools here in Pasadena, similar in some ways to, to, to West Market's a learning disability school. Um, uh, that school looked at 20 years of outcomes. One pair of classmates were at the extreme. One guy was in Malibu, started his own software company, checked out, doing amazing, you know, champagne, whatever, 35, retired, right? Another guy, 35, death row. They regressed their life outcomes on a bunch of stuff, and they regressed it, life outcomes as measured by income, as by the reported level of happiness, family stability, did they, you know, were they in a functional family unit, that kind of stuff. Grades predicted zero to five percent of where they sat on the success factor. Zero to five percent, as did their IQ scores. Their resiliency, their self-awareness, their proactivity, that completely drove it. And you think about a great leader, these are the characteristics that he or she will exhibit. That's really important to remember, right? So um, let's, uh, let's jump ahead. Given the time, I'm going to swim past a few things in the presentation because I want to make sure we have time for questions. Um, I want to do two last things and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. Um, I want to give you a brief history of uh, why the dyslexia movement is happening now. I was trained in history as an undergraduate, and I always wanted to know why now? Why didn't this happen 10 years ago? Why isn't it happening 10 years in the future? And I say there's a, a movement like this, the number of books that are coming out, um, the, the amount of conversation that's happening in public, the number of people who are dyslexic in public who are outing themselves as dyslexic is remarkable at this particular moment. And here's why. Oh, that's good. Um, in 1954, we had the Supreme Court decision that desegregated the U.S. school system, Brown versus Board of Education. Separate is not equal. That started a legal trend which would move us towards integration on many fronts. Um, then, uh, in 1975, we had the Education for All Handicapped Children Act. This was saying kids who, have, um, who are not standard get to go to school. Separate is not equal. Same law applied in that region. Um, this becomes IDEA, the Individuals with Disability Education Act, gives you IEPs, all that stuff. Um, that's me in 1980. Um, trust me, my mother had days when she was like, Ben, get in here! What did you blow up today? Um, so that's me. I'm identified in 1980 because there's a law now that says schools have to find you. It's called child find. Interestingly, in that era, the laws were more effective because the schools were, the money was new and there weren't as many kids identified yet. So they were like, sure, we'll identify everyone who walks in the door is dyslexic. Now they're like, what do you, I won't see anything. <laughs> well, that could be anything. Who knows? We'll get back to you. I'm like, there's a lot running around now. I want to make sure I distinguish um, schools as an entity from teachers. I think teachers on the front line do an excellent job, particularly at this school. But as a larger guest, round of applause for the teachers. <laughs> but they also miss something, which is um, the schools miss their obligation and, in fact, can slow things down. There's a lot in the book about law. I have a law degree, and that's something you're going to need to know about. Um, so then, in addition to that, uh, that's when you have the dyslexic baby boom. Then, now, we're having um, a, a series of books. Here's another book I really like, The Dyslexic Advantage, Robin Trinity. This book is about the brain science and rethinking it to start thinking about the strengths that come with this profile. Fascinating book, definitely worth a read. Um, now, uh, then, what happens when dyslexics get to be about my age? They start having children, okay? And it's not my child, it's my friend's child. But Daniel Sano, she's super cute. So, uh, so, um, so uh, we start having our own babies. Well, what happens first? First, the red line is the number of people who are identified as dyslexic, okay? 
That is because people started going up. So it went from, uh, from very, very few to very, very many. So now there's 2.3 identified people in the US school system. 2.3 million. 2.3 million identified. That's a big number, right? But at that time, we were identified and we didn't talk about it because of shame. Shame, shame, shame. It is a huge factor in this equation. And I didn't talk about it. My former wife, when we went back to my tenure reunion in law school, we showed up and like walking around and talking to people, and uh, they're you know, like, oh, I wrote a book, what on? Just like, why would you do that? And she looks at me and goes, they don't know. And I was like, mm -mm, didn't tell anyone. In fact, I hit it actively, kept it out of anyone's eye. I was a sniper on a hill. Like the snipers in the Navy, see it, you know, like the Navy Marine ones with like the bush on the head, like, it was like, you know, like that was me. I was like, I love books. And I am totally normal. <laughs> you know, like that was me then. And now I'm like, I think books are fine, and I'm not normal. <laughs> like that's, you know, that's essential to who I am. But once you have a child, and that child starts to feel the shame that you felt, you connect with them, and suddenly you want to talk about it. And that is the historical trend, the arrival of children to people who were identified 20, 30 years ago. That's what's driving the movement. That's what's the upswing. I'm going to finish on, on people who I would recommend highly in this space. This is not a comprehensive list, but it's a list of people who I think do great work. Um, and uh, I, I should disclose at the beginning that I have relationships with a bunch of these folks in various ways. Uh, you know, the National Center for Learning Disability has just published a bunch of blogs on my behalf. I uh, uh, I just rock. I love them. Uh, uh, we actually, I want to focus on um, a couple here. I'll come to Learning Ally last for a specific reason. Um, Decoding Dyslexia, a great organization. We'll actually put this slide out too. We'll email it around if we need to. Decoding Dyslexia is basically the group of, uh, I don't know if I would say the P version of this, but really frustrated, <laughs> we'll just say that, <laughs> blanked off, um, uh, uh, parents who want to change how things work. And each state at this point is getting one of these chapters. Check them out, they're really cool. I'm sure Mirror, Mirror would be happy to facilitate you know, reaching out there. Um, smart Kids, uh, Learning Expo is a great place. Dyslexiaville, that's coming soon. That's a kid's website about dyslexia, really great content. Then there's Bookshare and Learning Ally. We'll bid on them. I'm doing some consulting right now for, for Learning Ally. And I've known the head of uh, Bookshare for many years, Jim Fruchtemann. They both provide audiobooks and they do uh, that service uh, quite well. Audiobook as digital book in the case of Bookshare and as human read audio in the case of Learning Ally. Learning Ally is also launching a new service. It's called Parent Ally, and it's a remarkable service you should check out. Um, in particular, if you run into the parent and you all have this, because as soon as you went to Westmark, somebody in your neighborhood came to you and was like, so, um, my kid is dyslexic. What, how, what do I do? And you're like, well, <laughs> there's a lot, <laughs> and I'm not sure I can deal with all 74 of you just lined up at my house, <laughs> so. Parent Ally has, at this point, a 800 number you can point someone to. They can call and get an appointment with an experienced parent who will give them a half an hour of time to begin coaching and orienting them. And there's new services that will be rolling out. It's a pretty remarkable thing, and you should check it out. And you have an opportunity, which is, in the back left corner, is Andrew Freeman, who's the CEO of Learning Ally. He just happened to be out in town and said, could I crash the event? And I said, yes. So let's give him a round of applause. I used them to go through uh, through uh, my time at Stanford, and I used audio tapes then, four-track audio tapes. Now they have everything on an iPad, and like totally downloadable, and like jump around, and it's really cool. Check it out; it's really good. And also, kids will be more likely to use that because they just look like they're on the you know bus with an iPod and the hoodie, like who cares? Like they're just like, I'm I don't know if you're listening to. Um, so they can do whatever they want. So that that's a little background there. And with that, I think I'll wrap up the formal part of the presentation. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. And uh, I want to thank uh, the folks at Westmark, and I want to thank uh, in particular Mir Meredith, who has been such a, a long and direct friend to me individually and to the movement. Thank you for having me.